Hi, I'm Jenny Rawlings. The lecture that I'm about to present for you on fascia is actually a clip from a longer four hour continuing education course on my website that's called When to Be Anatomically Specific in Yoga. So if you're interested, you can definitely take the full course on my website anytime. It's designed for yoga teachers and yoga body geeks, and it also counts as continuing education hours with Yoga Alliance. The extra cool thing is that you can actually take the course for free because all the memberships on my website start with one week free trials. So just FYI about that. So with all of that said, let's turn our attention to the actual lecture on fascia. Let's take a look now at fascia. So fascia, as we've mentioned a couple of times, fascia is a tissue in the body that is, in my experience, definitely treated as a magic tissue. So we had magic muscles, uh, and, the, and we, we looked at the muscle tissue. Now we're talking fascia, and fascia being really pulled out and treated as like an extra special or an extra magical tissue. You may agree with me, or you may have experienced that fascia has become a buzzword in the yoga and movement worlds. It's even gone so far as like I, I've seen before a t-shirt printed in yoga circles that says fascia is the new black. Like that's the that's the saying on the t-shirt. So just to show how much of like a buzz term it has become. So we hear about fascia. Here are just some places where we hear about it. We hear about uh, myofascial release, which we've mentioned a couple times. We hear about fascial slings and chains and trains. We hear about breaking down fascial adhesions and knots and, and, fa and scar tissue in your fascia. It's all about the fascia. And we hear that like in yin yoga, yin yoga makes these claims that yin yoga targets the fascia. And there's even more. I bet you can picture more claims and more ways in which you see fascia kind of pulled out and treated as an extra special tissue. Now, just to give a definition of fascia, fascia is a type of connective tissue that forms a continuous body-wide web inside of us, surrounding and interpenetrating all of our muscles, bones, organs, nerves, and blood and lymph vessels. So translation, fascia is everywhere inside of us. It's literally everywhere. It kind of knits its way into and through everything and unites everything. Now, because of that, fascia is everywhere. So that would necessarily imply that we can't actually target fascia in any sort of isolated way. Like uh, it's just so interwoven and interconnected. We're never truly isolating fascia. So I would suggest that in most contexts where we see fascia discussed in our language, you know, this is of course kind of about our teaching language. In most contexts where we see fascia, discussed in a way in which it's as though we could isolate it, as though we're targeting it specifically, remember specific versus non-specific. In most cases, I don't think that's an accurate way of talking about the body or or talking about what's really happening in the body. It's probably it's probably not what like is actually happening. So when it comes to uh, massage therapy balls and myofascial release and self myofascial release, which is what we tend to see like in the yoga world, and also body work and actual massage settings where a massage therapist is working on a client, what we should know is that we cannot actually change fascia with our hands or with massage tools. So fascia is made up of, it's type of connective tissue, like I said, it's made up of collagen. And collagen is actually an amazingly strong tissue in the body. It's like extremely strong. So as this quote here uh, reads, the force necessary to break up or remove myofascial adhesions would exceed the physiological limitations of most people. So in order to really change the super strong tissue in your body that we're calling fascia, in order to really make changes to it, would probably require so much force that would probably break you or break bones. Like it's just not a tissue that we can like deform and change in like a permanent way, like with our hands or with massage tools. So we should know that. And as I've discussed a few times now, the main benefits of uh, practices like like rolling and massage, like rolling on balls and massage tools and massage 
are most likely to be neurologically driven. So it's much more likely to be the case that it's the nervous system that's responding to this like sensory input of the massage or the rolling. And that's what's probably creating the positive benefits that we experience after massage. It's not about like, like uh, releasing or breaking up any sort of like specific tissue because you can't realistically do that in the human body. So I have that fourth bullet point, systemic versus local. It's like really what's probably happening is neurological or nervous system, like this more systemic uh, effect or change versus anything that's like local and specific uh, to the actual tissue. So when we say that uh, it's the nervous system that's probably what's really responsible for what's happening when we're doing, quote, myofascial release techniques, here are just some examples of, of what we mean by that. So uh, there are like three examples here. And the first one is the gate control theory of pain. If you took my pain science for yogis course here on the website, you will be familiar with this. And if not, and if you're interested, go take that course because that's an awesome course. I think everyone with a body, but especially yoga people should know about pain science. And we've, of course, touched on pain science a bit in this course, but that course is really a specific deep dive into pain science. So the gait control theory of pain in just a very summarized way basically suggests that non-painful stimuli can turn down the volume on painful sensations. So if someone has pain in a certain area of their body, if they do like massage, like rolling on balls, and if that feels good, and if it feels like they release tension or released something, you know, that's the sensory experience. If it's a non-painful stimuli, that might help on a systemic level. It might help turn down the volume on otherwise painful sensations that may be experienced in other areas of the body. So that's loosely like the gate control theory of pain. And that's neurologically mediated. That's something the nervous system is doing. It's not anything local happening in the actual tissue. And then another possible neural mechanism for like pain relief from rolling and massage is, is diffuse noxious inhibitory control or DNIC. And this is a little bit of flip side. So whereas the gate control theory, theory was like non-painful stimuli can turn down painful sensations in other areas of the body. With DNIC, it's more like pain inhibits pain. Uh, like a distraction. So this would maybe play more of a role when someone is doing rolling or receiving massage that's like really deep tissue and that's like maybe maybe kind of hurts and makes them cringe. So like deep pressure, you know, that in and of itself is like a painful stimuli. And so the way that like DNIC would work is that painful stimuli could, um, could turn, like act like a distraction from the other pain that someone may be experiencing in their body. And that may be how particularly like uncomfortable forms of massage or rolling on balls, that might be how they work to the extent that if you roll on a ball that you do feel better. Because not everybody does, but people do. And then a third way that the nervous system could help with, uh, with pain relief is more of just general parasympathetic nervous system activation. So we know that when we shift a little more into the rest and digest side of the autonomic nervous system, we know from lots of research that that is actually associated with just general decreased pain perception. So that's just yet another way that uh, something like rolling on balls uh, or receiving a massage, that's another way that like it just, it relaxes you in general or it could relax you. Maybe if you're not doing like super intense forms of it, uh, it could relax you and just relaxing in general and shifting more into parasympathetic nervous system side can help reduce painful perceptions. So I think that's very cool to know. Now this meme, <laughs> I didn't create this meme. I saw this somewhere uh, like like a few years ago and I thought it was super funny. So I recreated it for um, for this course, but I didn't come up with this. I can't quite remember who. It was some uh, evidence-based pain science informed physical therapist. I think that person created it and put it, up, put it out there. But anyway, I love it because it's, I think, a really good way of kind of summarizing some of our messaging today, which is like, uh, if we don't need to be overly specific, Maybe we shouldn't be overly specific. And this meme is just like, is just showing that like basically the term massage and the term myofascial release, they really mean the same thing. Like they're not different. When you're using the term myofascial release, when one uses the term myofascial release, 
The term is implying that you're very specifically releasing myofascia. So myo means muscle and fascia means fascia. So it's implying that something really specific is happening in the tissue. And in my mind, it's more of this technical term. It has more of a clinical implication. It just seems more like that's just sophisticated myofascial release. Like that's not just massage, but actually myofascial release, all that it is ultimately is massage. Massage is just like rubbing flesh, like uh, protruding in. It could be with the hands of a massage therapist. It could be with massage tools. It could be rolling or rubbing your body on, on anything else. It doesn't have to be a massage tool, but just the impression into the body, into the skin, that's going to interact with your nervous system. And that's what's going to be responsible for the changes that you may experience. So all myofascial release is massage. And if we, um, if we want to just be like accurate in our words, we would call, we would call, uh, my, like myofascial release, release techniques, like rolling on balls. That would just be called massage because that is what it is. But I think sometimes just to sound more sophisticated or to sound, you know, like what we're doing is better or more effective. It, it's called myofascial release in many realms of the yoga world, many corners or sub communities in the yoga world, but it's nothing more than just massage. So I think the actual evidence-based way to label these practices is massage. Like if I brought balls into my class, I would probably call them like massage balls, like we're massaging ourselves. But you can see that there's a temptation, like massage just seems like ho-hum. It seems unsophisticated, like people who don't really know what they're doing or who aren't learned and educated, they, they massage, but we, we're technical, we're clinical. We're like specifically treating specific tissues. We are doing myofascial release. Therefore, it's the sophisticated Winnie the Pooh, <laughs> but ultimately it's the same thing. And so in an effort to not overly complicate things and not maybe use overly specific terms that aren't really supported by the research, I think that um, it's more evidence-based to probably use the simpler term and to not worry about whether you appear sophisticated or like a more informed or more knowledgeable teacher or not. Because ultimately what the research and what the actual scientific knowledge supports is that myofascial release isn't, that's not an accurate term. That's not really what's happening. So we're better off just calling it massage. And I pulled this quote here from a great study that looks specifically at uh, self-myofascial release. And in there, they write, the current evidence indicates that the term self-myofascial release is misleading and a misnomer. So basically, just kind of reiterating what I've already said, uh, I don't think the term myofascial release is necessary. I don't think it's scientifically accurate. And yeah, I think if we want to be truly evidence-based, we we probably would just call it massage. Even though that might sound less sophisticated, it's more accurate and it's more evidence-based. We don't need to be so tissue specific because that's not the level on which uh, massage, the effects of massage are even taking place. It's nervous system. It's global. It's systemic. It's non-specific. Uh, and then just to reiterate, although fascia is treated like a magic tissue, it's not a magic tissue. It's, it's important. I'm definitely not trying to to suggest it's not, but it's just as important as all of the other super important and amazing and fascinating tissues in the body, including muscle and nerves and blood vessels and so much else. Like the entire body is fascinating. We want to learn about it all, including fascia, but we don't necessarily need to highlight fascia as extra important or that we are targeting the special tissue of fascia in special ways in yoga and movement because uh, we're for the most part, we're not, uh, according to research. <laughs> <laughs>